You know, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, but it shall not be so with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of my favorite comic strips is Calvin and Hobbes. When I was younger, I used to uh, love getting the daily newspaper. I actually, my brother and I were actually paper boys and we would get the daily newspaper and we'd read the comics. Calvin and Hobbes was always my favorite. It's funny, but it also touches on important life issues. For example, it often deals with power dynamics. Like when Calvin's mom calls out, bath time, Calvin, and she can't find him. She's like, come on, let's just get it over with this time. All right. Then she's still searching. Where are you? Let's go. And then here's Calvin safely hidden in his bathtub, just lying down. She'll never look here. <laughs> the power struggle between parents and kids can be very real. Calvin, though, also experiences not just like struggles in his family, he also experiences the abuse of power. Like when Rosalind was babysitting and she's just lounging on the couch, talking on the phone with her boyfriend. She's like, hey, baby doll. Yeah, I'm babysitting the kid down the street. Yeah, that's right. The little monster. Mm -hmm. well, uh, well, so far, no problem. He hasn't been any trouble. You just have to show these kids who's boss. Mm -hmm. And then we finally see at the end of the comic, Calvin and Hobbes together sitting next to the family car. And Calvin is asking Hobbes, how much longer till she lets us out of the garage? And Calvin replies, well, she said eight o'clock. It's almost 6.30 now. Ooh, locked in his garage. Yikes. Sometimes Calvin's power struggles are so tough and he feels it so deeply. He tells Hobbes one time, you know, sometimes the world seems like a pretty mean place. And Hobbes says, that's why animals are so soft and huggy. And Calvin says, yeah, as they embrace one another. Because yeah, sometimes we all just need a hug because the world is tough. The world is tough, no matter where you live, at what point in human history, human beings tend to take advantage of one another, to abuse power, or to misuse authority. It's so common. It's so common, I'm sure that you can think of things right now. You can think of examples right now at work, or at home, or maybe even in your own actions. Some abuse of power. Oh, yeah, I said that. I took advantage of that person. No one wants it this way. No one likes to be exploited. It's just the way the world works. So what can you do about it? Thank God that through Jesus Christ, there is another way to use power and authority. In our gospel passage this morning from Mark chapter 10, Jesus and his disciples, the context is Jesus and his disciples, they're on their way to Jerusalem. You remember, we've been following this story. They've headed towards Jerusalem. And Jesus has just in the verse before told them that when they get to Jerusalem, he's going to be mocked, spit on, flogged, and killed, and after three days, rise. And James and John, two of Jesus' closest buddies, think to themselves, you know what, now seems like the right time to see if we could lock down those positions of power that we've been hoping for once we get to Jerusalem. Talk about adventures in missing the point. Jesus says, I'm about to die in verse 34. And in verse 35, James and John are asking, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Jesus says, well, what do you want me to do for you? And they say, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Despite what Jesus just said, James and John still have this idea that when they get to Jerusalem, which is the city of David, Jesus, who's David's descendant and rightful heir to the throne of Israel, he's going to rise to political power. 
It's going to be a new government. And these guys want in on it. More than that, they want the number two and number three positions in Jesus' new government. They want to sit at his right and left hand. They want power and authority and all the perks that come with it. And verse 41 says that when the 10 heard it, they began to be indignant with James and John. The other disciples just get angry about the whole thing. This isn't fair. Who did James and John think they are anyway? And it's probably not because they're like so righteous that they just see the error in James and John's ways. They're annoyed probably because they didn't think of it first. They, they, they also want these cushy seats of power. And now they're worried they're going to be sidelined in the new government. But for Jesus, this whole situation, this whole line of questioning reveals a problem with the disciples' hearts. In verse 38, he says, you don't know what you're asking. You still don't get it. This isn't how God's kingdom works. We don't trade in the acquisition and maintenance of power. Yes, our people are oppressed, but we don't simply overthrow the Roman oppressor to prop ourselves up. That just continues the same old cycle of power and its abuse. Jesus actually isn't interested in overthrowing Rome. He's interested in overthrowing the evil in people's hearts that leads to exploitation and abuse in the first place. He's got a different plan entirely, and it involves not weapons of war, not political savvy, but a cup and a baptism. You don't know what you're asking. Jesus continues in verse 38. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? The cup and the baptism are all about death. They're all about, they're not about getting power. They're about dying, giving up power. Specifically, they're about Jesus' sacrificial death for the sake of others. The cup Jesus drinks is his acceptance of God's will as he approaches his crucifixion. You remember before his arrest, Jesus prays, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus' baptism is also about his death. When he was immersed or baptized into our sin, our death, the prophet Isaiah, which we also read this morning, he says, Jesus, he was pierced for our transgressions, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus turns the entire struggle for power and authority upside down, whereas others grasp for power to enjoy its perks, to abuse its privileges at the expense of others. In his death, Jesus voluntarily gives up his power and undermines the whole system, undermines the whole thing. This is the way of God's kingdom. This is actually the kind of thing God blesses. In fact, the Apostle Paul says Christ's sacrifice is why God exalted Jesus and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. This is the true use of power, sacrifice in service of others. And contrary to what James and John are hoping for, this is actually the kind of life that Jesus invites his disciples to share. In verse 42, Jesus calls his disciples to himself, sort of like, hey, everyone, I see we're talking about power again. You remember this has happened like in chapter nine, chapter eight. This is a teachable moment, gather around. And Jesus tells his disciples, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so 
among you. This isn't the way. We're going to use power, guys. Instead, verse 43, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you want to be one of the great ones, well, then you're going to have to become a servant of all, of everyone. After all, Jesus says, I didn't even come to be served as some like head of state in the halls of power, but to serve others and even give my life up for them. In these verses here, Jesus sets up his own sacrifice as an example for his followers to copy. Others exercise authority over one another, but not so with me, and so not so with you. In Christ, we all, all of us disciples of Jesus, his 12 then, but us as well now, we're invited to leave behind the pursuit of power, the pursuit of power and authority over others. We just get to leave the whole thing behind. And instead, we get to embrace life together, a different kind of life, a life that's characterized by mutuality. Christians are not to rule over one another. It's not what we do. In fact, in the Garden of Eden, if you remember, when, when we first hear about people ruling over other people, it's a direct result of sin. Adam and Eve eat the fruit, and the result is that, well, now the man will rule over you. A direct result of our sin. But in the new Adam, our relationships with one another are restored to their original mutuality. And so the Apostle Paul says, out of your deep reverence for Christ, respect and admiration for his sacrificial life and death, we too now get to submit ourselves to one another. In Christ, a beautiful new world has been born, and we do get to be part of it, just not in the way James and John wanted or thought that it was supposed to be. Instead of receiving seats of power over others, our participation in this new world starts as we receive Christ's cup and baptism. Jesus asked James and John, are you going to drink my cup and receive my baptism? And oh, yes, they say. And Jesus replies, you know what? You're right. You will drink my cup and you will receive my baptism. And you can hear an allusion in these statements to the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion, where followers of Christ receive his own life and learn to follow his example. If Jesus was immersed into our sin and death in Christian baptism, we now get to be immersed in his death and subsequent resurrection. Romans 6 says, we were buried with Christ by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. In the cup, we receive Christ's blood of the new covenant. And so a new quality of life that Jesus calls eternal. In John 6, he says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Also in John, Jesus just defines eternal life. It says eternal life is knowing you, that they may know you, my father, and know the one you've sent. Jesus' cup and baptism lead to a whole new way of being human, a newness of life, a life knowing God, a life knowing Jesus. Yes, it includes a future resurrection life, this, this eternal life. But that eternal life and in the, the, the life in the future also has like 10,000 implications for our life today. It gets to start even now. One of those implications of which is learning a new economy of power. 
when we receive Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit pattern our lives after him, we are formed into people who no longer use power to take advantage of others, but instead to serve others. And this formation that we undergo, it's ongoing. It happens throughout our lives. It doesn't happen, as my friend says, automatically. It's a discipleship process, ongoing. And that matters so much because our tendency to lord our power over others is deeply ingrained in us. It's deeply ingrained in me. And I think most often it stems from a profound insecurity. I think we often abuse our power because we feel at risk. We feel unsafe ourselves. We may act like big bullies, all tough and hard, but inside we're feeling like nobody really cares about me. Like nobody's gonna be fair to me in this life. Others are gonna take advantage of me, so I better take advantage of them first. And the formation that we need to get out of that is a formation for our insecurities to be transformed into an absolute confidence in our safety in Christ. So that it's out of this safety that we can stop the cycle of power abuse. It works like this. When we drink Christ's cup and receive his baptism, we die with Christ and we're united to him in his resurrection. And that means that now, having already died and possessing this unshakable eternal life, even if we are confronted with death itself, we are still safe. We're safe. We're still safe. And if we are safe even in death, well then, my friends, we're safe in life. All of it no matter what happens in our lives. And as we're continually formed in this way, in Christ's likeness, we learn to live in increasing measure out of this place of safety, out of this salvation. So if we're safe, we don't need any longer to lord our authority over others. We don't need to manipulate others and manipulate outcomes to protect ourselves because we're not anxiously insecure anymore. Instead, we're freed up to use our power and authority differently. We can serve others. We can empower them. We can maintain a peaceful and generous presence that flows from a fundamental security in Christ and his unshakable life. I'll give you an example. When Julia and I were first married, I remember hearing a marriage and family therapist saying that one of the devil's favorite tactics to hurt marriages is to divide and conquer, to try to get one of the folks to like accuse the other of saying, hey, you have a problem. You've got the problem. It's not me. It's your problem. But when we're secure in Christ, we're freed up to say something different than just you have a problem, divide and conquer. Instead of saying you have a problem, we can say something like, we have a problem. So the relationship isn't, is, isn't in jeopardy. We're, our relationship is, is coming from a place of security, but we, we gen, genuinely have a problem. But instead of you have a problem, go fix it, we can say, well, let's stand shoulder to shoulder here. Let's face our problem and let's together use our power to tackle it as one. Security in Christ, it allows us to confront our own deficiencies when necessary. It allows us to give up the battle that just wants to win at all costs, and instead to honestly serve for the benefit of the other. This is, this is what the security in Christ allows us to do. We can, we can face unimaginably difficult situations because we know we're safe in Christ already. This is how power and authority work in God's kingdom. It's all submitted to the lordship of Jesus who exercises his authority and power in a completely new 
way. Sacrifice for the benefit of others. Can you imagine this kind of use of power? Church, behold Jesus. This is our God. And this is the way of his kingdom. He doesn't domineer or coerce. He serves. He gives himself up for you and for me because he loves us. He loves us. Friends, this morning, as you remember your baptism, and as you look forward to the time when you receive Holy Communion once again, remember Christ's sacrifice for you. Remember his sacrifice. Once again, remember how he uses his power to love you well and receive the security of his resurrection life. And allow yourself to be freed from the need to control or to manipulate others. Allow yourself to be served and lifted up and so made able to serve and lift up others. Friends, may Christ be exalted in our worship, and may he be exalted in our manner of living, especially in our use of power and authority. Amen.